In the first video of this series on Lagrangian mechanics, I said how it would be very difficult to model a double pendulum with Newtonian mechanics. Today, we will model a double pendulum with Lagrangian mechanics. On the right is a diagram of the double pendulum. The strings have lengths L1 and L2 respectively, and the point masses have a mass of m1 and m2. Also, we will be using the angles from the vertical to describe the motion of the system. The first thing that we have to do is map the position of each point particle, and we can do that using the angles and the length of the strings. I will first do the x-coordinate of the first uh, particle and its x-coordinate is going to be equal to L1 times sine of theta1. Next, I can do uh, the y-coordinate of that same particle, and that's going to be equal to negative L1 times cosine of theta1. When dealing with the position of particle 2, you need to remember that it also depends on the position of particle 1. You can do pretty much the same thing for x2 and y2 as you did for x1 and y1, but you have to remember that there is going to be an x1 term in the x2 equation and a y1 term in the y2 equation as shown on the screen. Now we have the position of both particles in the form of x and y coordinates in terms of the angles. You can then take the time derivative of each of these quantities and then get the components of the velocity in the x and y direction for both particles. But firstly, let's take the time derivative of x1 to get x1 dot. For this, we can use the chain rule and take the derivative of x1 with respect to theta1 and then multiply it by the time derivative of theta1. So the derivative of sine of theta1 with respect to theta1 is cosine of theta1, and the time derivative of theta1 is theta1 dot. So that will be the answer as shown on the screen. The process for the other coordinates are exactly the same. The only thing that you have to remember is that the derivative of cosine of theta is negative sine of theta. As you can see here, I will just be filling in the rest of the velocities the good thing about the y coordinates is that it's all negative cosines of theta, or, so that when you take the derivative of it, it becomes positive, which is why all of the terms in the uh, x, x dot and y dot are all positive. Now we pretty much have everything we need to form the kinetic energy of the system. The kinetic energy is going to be equal to uh, 1 half m1 v1 squared plus 1 half m2 v2 squared. Straight from the Pythagorean theorem, we know that the velocity squared is going to be equal to the sum of the components squared. This means that v1 squared is equal to x1 dot squared plus y1 dot squared. Squaring each and summing them up, we get that k is equal to 1 half m times L1 squared times theta1 dot squared times cosine squared theta1 plus L1 squared theta1 dot squared times sine squared theta1. Unfortunately, V2 is a little bit more difficult because we have to square two binomials and then sum them up. Just like the previous example, V2 squared is equal to x2 dot squared plus y2 dot squared. If you write all of that out while still unexpanded, it will look like this. After expanding this, it's going to get quite messy and quite large, so there are a few things that we can do to simplify it, and it's just two simple trig identities. Here are the two trig identities. It's just the classic Pythagorean trig identity, which says that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to one, then the cosine subtraction formula, which says that cosine of theta 1 minus theta 2 is equal to cosine theta 1 times cosine theta 2 plus sine of theta 1 times sine of theta 2. 
we can use the first identity to simplify the first term of the kinetic energy equation. So inside of the parentheses, if we factor out in L1 squared theta 1 dot squared, we are left with cosine squared theta 1 plus sine squared theta 1, which we know is equal to 1. So all we're left with is 1 half m1 times L1 squared theta 1 dot squared. For the second term, before simplifying, we need to expand everything. So we need to expand those two binomials. Squaring a binomial a plus b is equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. In order to make the simplifying process easier, I'm just going to put the squared terms first and then all of the mixed terms at the end. So if we were dealing with a plus b, I would be putting a squared plus b squared, and then on the next binomial, I'd be putting c squared plus d squared, and then all of the mixed terms after. So I am just expanding that out right now. Uh, you might be able to notice what identities that we'll have to use. We'll be using both of them this time. For the mixed terms, we will have to use the cosine subtraction formula. And then for the squared terms, we can, we'll be able to factor out certain terms and then just be left with the, left, left with the cosine squared plus sine squared of theta. And now I am just writing out the mixed terms. Now that all of the expanding is done, we can begin the simplifying. In the first and third term inside the second set of parentheses, if you factor out and L1 squared theta 1 dot squared, you are left with cosine squared theta 1 plus sine squared theta 1, which is equal to 1. So that means all we're left with is L1 squared theta 1 dot squared. You can do the same thing for the second and fourth terms in that second set of parentheses, and you are left with L2 squared theta 2 dot squared. You can then factor out uh, 2L1 L2 theta 1 dot theta 2 dot out of the uh, fifth and sixth terms, and then you are left with cosine of theta 1, cosine theta 2, plus sine theta 1 times sine of theta 2, which, if you remember, is one of our identities. Rewriting everything once again and simplifying anything that can be simplified, we arrive at this. This already looks pretty messy, and this is just the kinetic energy. We still have the potential energy to subtract later. Now we can start with the potential energy. Luckily, this is a lot simpler than the kinetic energy. Let's scroll up and look at what we have already. Gravitational potential energy is just mgh, but what is the h in this case? It's just going to be y1 and y2, so we can just plug in m1, g, and then y1, and then add that with m2, g, y2. The zero point for our gravitational potential energy is going to be the ceiling, so it will always be negative. That negative comes from the y1 and y2, but I'm just going to carry that to the front. After doing that, we get that this is our gravitational potential energy and thus all of our potential energy. We have the kinetic energy. We have the potential energy. That's all we need to form the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian, again, is the difference between the kinetic and potential energies. That's a lot to write. I don't really want to rewrite it, so I'm just going to copy that real quick and then paste the kinetic energy, and then I will put the potential energy right after that. But also remember, it's minus the potential energy. So I'm going to change those two minus signs into addition signs. And that is it for this video. This is a part one. There will be another part where we actually plug it into the Euler-Lagrange equation and take derivatives and then actually find the equations of motion for this double pendulum. But for now, 
we have the Lagrangian, which is a good step. Thank you for watching. When ready, the next video will be linked in the description, so make sure to check that out. Thank you again. Bye.